Are you guys ready? Welcome everyone. We're so glad you're able to join us today for Earthing's webinar about EMFs, which include 5G, dirty electricity, and more. My name is Kylie and I'll be your host today. With me is a man who likely needs no introduction. Clint Ober is the pioneer of earthing and the discoverer of the health benefits of grounding the human body. He is a best-selling author and the founder and CEO of EarthFX Incorporated and Earthing.com. Before he discovered grounding, he was deeply involved in the development of safe cable communications and installations in the United States. Welcome, Clint. I'd also like to introduce our guest speaker um, and our guest expert, the director of the Earthing Institute, Dr. Gaetan Chevalier. Dr. Chevalier holds a PhD in engineering physics from the University of Montreal. He is a visiting scholar in the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health at the UC San Diego School of Medicine. He is also a core faculty member and former director of research at the California Institute for Human Science in Encinitas, California, which is a leading center for the investigation of healing applications of subtle energies. Dr. Chevalier's experiments, findings, and 15 scientific studies on the bioelectrical changes generated by grounding have opened a new frontier of ele electrophysiological research into the striking differences between grounded and ungrounded human beings. Welcome, Gaetan. Thank you. It's an honor to have you both with us today. Thank you so much for being here. And so we put this webinar together today because over the years, hundreds of people have come to us at both earthing.com and the Earthing Institute with questions regarding EMFs and dirty electricity. They are oftentimes confused or concerned by what they have heard from these sources, from other sources on these topics as they relate to grounding the human body. It's easy to understand how this can be worrisome, especially when these people are electricians, electrical engineers, or have credentials behind their names, such as MD and PhD. These experts, however, aren't necessarily fully informed about, the, about grounding in the way that they need to be, and they may not understand its complete impact on the human body. Clint and Gaetan are considered to be the world's top authorities regarding the health impacts of grounding, as Clint has been studying grounding for the past 20 years and Gaetan for the past 15. And so here's a little bit about um, how the webinar is going to work today. First, Gaetan is going to give some brief answers to the top three questions that we received regarding dirty electricity, ground currents, and EMFs. This is for those of you who may not have a lot of time today or may not be interested in diving too deeply into the scientific principles and physics behind the answers. Um, and then secondly, Gaetan will give a comprehensive presentation that he's compiled to explain the science behind the myths, miscon misconceptions, and truths surrounding EMFs and dirty electri electricity as they relate to being grounded. Then we'll um, wrap up things with a Q&A where Gaetan and Clint will answer some individual questions that we've received from viewers on Clint's last couple of webinars. Please note that unlike Clint's past two webinars, due to the complex nature of this subject matter, we will not be taking any live questions today. Depending on the response we receive to this webinar and how many follow-up questions our customer support team receives, we may schedule a future webinar to answer more of these questions. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, Gaetan, could you please give relatively short answers um, for these three popular questions that we received? Okay. And um, remember everybody, he will be diving deeper into the science behind the answers in his prepared presentation portion of this webinar. So the first question is, do people need to worry about dirty electricity or ground currents while they're grounded? The short answer is no. And of course, um, there's a lot of uh, different perspective on that that you see out there. Uh, about, for example, let's talk about dirty electricity. So dirty electricity uh, is seen as a threat, you know, by many people, and I don't want to dive into it right now. But uh, our research has shown that uh, there's absolutely nothing to fear there. They're not penetrating, they're not penetrating the body. And ground currents are exceedingly rare. There's a few barn in Minnesota that somebody has investigated, and it's a very special situation that you will not encounter in normal life. No 
um, the, the ground currents are basically a non-issue except for extremely specific situations. If you, if you were walking just next to a power, electrical power uh, station, okay, that's a problem. Or if you were just a few feet from the train, electric train tracks, or that's, that's the only reasons where you would have possibly some problems. But normal life, just don't worry about this. And of course, dirty electricity, if you're a healthy person and you ground yourself every day, this will not affect you. Uh, some electrosensitive people will feel EMFs when they are in the presence of EMF in a house. But still, if they ground themselves, grounding will be beneficial. We have to remember that grounding is not about you know, a meta of the shieldings perfectly against EMF. That's not the goal of earthing. Earthing is about being connected with the planet Earth, receiving electrons in the frequency that the planet give us, which fill our batteries uh, because we are bioelectrical system, give us energy, uh, replenish our immune system, make our immune system function to the max, including being able to wear off inflammation very quickly. No inflammation possible when you're grounded. Uh, it's de-stress people. It's, uh, it's, uh, we've have several studies that show to relax people. And uh, so you'll have a better life and have your life. So that's, that's the goal of earthing in the short. Perfect. Um, the next highly popular question <clears throat> was, how can we protect ourselves against high frequency EMFs, including tablets, computers, Wi-Fi, wireless and 5G satellite, antennas and devices? So the short answer again is that we have to be prudent with these devices and just um, know that they have some you know, potential effects. But if you're healthy again, and if you keep grounded all the time, you will not have any problem with that. Uh, <clears throat> when we go into the more detailed answers, I'll answer some of the tips that we can do to help ourselves. But remember, everything will regenerate your body, um, help you know the regeneration mechanisms of your body when you're grounded at night. That's when your body you know is in best position to regenerate itself. So it's always going to be a plus and you're going to be above the curve if you stay grounded, you know, regularly every day. Perfect. And um, our last highly asked question was, are earthing products sufficient to protect against EMFs in general and high frequency EMFs like 5G? Yeah, it's kind of like a little bit uh, answered already. Mm -hmm. that, uh, they're not designed to protect you against EMF, although they will protect you against certain EMF like dirty electricity, no problem. And certain others will be less effective, but that's not their goal. Their goal is for you to live a healthy life like we're designed to be. We're designed to be in contact with the earth. We're designed to have an immune system that functions to the max, to have energy, not to be tired all the time. So, um, so we'll dive a little bit into more uh, answers about this question a little down the road. But uh, for now, I think that's given an overview that there's really, if you are on LT, sure, you have to look more closely. But if you are a relatively healthy people, person, grounding will help you overcome all the situations you may encounter with EMF. Okay? That's right. the short answer. Okay. Well, thank you so much for getting those frequently asked questions. Um, Given that, yeah, getting them answered. Uh, that was really informative, and we would like. I'm sorry, one second here. Okay, okay, so Gaetan is going to go ahead and give the presentation he prepared to explain the scientific why behind the answers he just gave. After that, he and Clint will be responding to some individual questions we've received as well. So Gaetan, you can feel free to go ahead and start your presentation as soon as you're ready. Okay, here we go. Well, welcome everyone. And uh, this presentation is designed to help people 
uh, clear up a lot of misunderstanding that exists about electromagnetic field and what they do. Because once you understand electromagnetic field, you will understand a lot about electricity itself. Uh, so the first question is, what are electromagnetic field? The short answer is electric and magnetic fields zipping through space at the speed of light. Now, this is a short answer that needs a lot of explanations. Uh, most people uh, do not understand fully what it means and th that generates so much misunderstanding. So we have to step back a little bit and go back to the basics. And to help us with that, let's look at myth number one. Ions can flow through, through a wire. We hear that all the time. That, yeah, and you'll see probably in some questions uh, that people think, well, can ions from the earth come through my body? And uh, you know, is that how everything works? No, there's no ions. Everything's about electrons. So in order to understand that, we have to go back to the basics, which is the structure of matter. What is matter composed of? It's composed of atoms. And every atoms, every molecule is made of a number of atoms. So just a, a reminder for everyone, an atom is made of a nucleus and which has two particles in it in general, a proton, which is charged positively, a neutron, which is neutral, and zipping around the nucleus are electrons, which are smaller particles, <clears throat> lighter particles that are charged negatively with the exact opposite charge as a proton, which is a positively charged. So what keeps the electron zipping around the atom is actually an electrostatic force that exists between the electrons and protons. Electrons and protons attract each other. And so that creates the force that maintains atoms together. So it's really the basic force in the universe that maintains all matter. It's an electrostatic force. For example, um, and people, talk about ions, you know, what is an ion? An ion is an atom and molecule. See, this, this atom is neutral, has as many electrons as protons. Neutrons are neutral, so they're not a problem. But let's say that you're able to knock off an electron from this atom. Then what will happen is that you have one more positive charge than negative charge. And when you see the atom from a distance, it will behave like a positive charge. It will be a positive ion. That's what we mean by positive ions or ions. Now, you may have circumstances, especially in certain molecules, where you can have an additional electron or two. In that case, then you have more electrons than protons. And now your atom is become negatively charged, and that becomes a negative ion. Now, in most of the atmosphere that we're breathing, there are positive ions are much more present than negative ions. That's why when we get close to certain place where there are negative ions, we feel good. Like you go to the ocean, for example, you breathe the air and next to the ocean, there's a lot of negative ions there. If you go to a certain forest also, you have lots of negative ions. But in general, we breed positive ions. And that, that's not a problem, that's the way we design. But uh, you will see that um, too much po positive charge in our body is not so good. Now, to get to the next level of understanding here, so okay, we have atoms. And then they group together, they form molecules and solids. i give you an example here the crystalline structure of a table salt, which is uh, sodium and chlorine. So these atoms link together, the sodium being the big red green one, and they link together by what? By exchanging electron. Again, what maintain the entire structure of the crystal are electrostatic forces between atoms. And it's the same for every material. They're not have crystalline structure 
but <clears throat> they all have atoms that are linked like this. And so you can see now that the protons and neutrons, which are inside the nucleus right here, they are bound to the structure of the material. Without them, the crystal or the material will dissolve, will disintegrate. So they cannot move. What can move are the electrons. In metals, for example, electron can be shared all anywhere along the metallic structure. So that's why we use them as conductor. That's what they call conductors. And so a copper wire, for example, when uh, it's using an electrical circuit, then electrons can move through it freely. And that is, as I said, a conductor. But no ion ever flow through a wire because the ions, if there were any, they will be bound to the structure. And, and, um, and that was a problem with DC currents, like, you know, in the old days, they were using DC currents to power homes. They found that the copper wire become brittle and they fall apart. That is because using a copper wire with a DC current, the flow of electrons at some point, take away some electrons from the structure and you get a, a, a brittle and a wire. So AC is much better for that because the, the electrons just move back and forth. Anyway, this is a little technical, but just to let you know <clears throat> that Ions can never, never, never flow through a wire. It's only electrons. Every current that flows in your home, every device, your computer, everything, cell phone, it's all about electrons. So I hope we nail this one and you understand that if somebody start talking about flow of, of uh, ions through your body or through any solid object or any circuit, just uh, go away and talk to somebody else because these people will not be able to shed any light on this, on this subject matter. In fact, they're gonna just confuse you. Okay, so let's go a little deeper. Our goal is to explain what is an electromagnetic wave. So let's go deeper into the electric field. As I said, positive charge has a positive electric field around them. It goes, the lines here show the electric field going outward. These electric field lines are actually representing, if I put a little positive charge here, it will be repelled and going away from the positive charge here. That's why the arrows are in this direction. In the case of a negative charge, the arrow goes in because a test charge that we'll put here will be attracted towards it. So these are really lines of force. <clears throat> That's what an electric field is. Now you put the negative and positive uh, particles next to each other, and it's like they like each other. You can see the, the field lines of one complement into the other, and you'll have an attraction between the two, and the attraction is gonna be right in the shorter distance between the two, where the density of field line is a greater. So this is attraction, but any positive charge against a positive charge or a negative charge against a, a negative charge, you'll always have repulsion, okay? So uh, that's how the electric field works. So two charge of opposite sign attract each other. Two negative charge repel each other. Two positive charge repel each other. <clears throat> that brings us to myth number two. The electric field and magnetic field are pretty much the same thing. I see often in videos people using magnets to try to illustrate how electric field works. No, that's not correct. A magnetic field and electric field are very different beast <laughs> entities, even though they work a lot together, and I'll show you how they are very different. The electrostatic or electric field is present everywhere. That's the basis of what. Electroma the magnetic field comes from uh, a way to use those electric charge. I'll talk to you about that later. <coughs> Sorry. So let's see what the electric field does in real life. 
So let's take, for example, here it says a plastic rod. It could be a plastic pen, <coughs> pencil. <coughs> and you have animal fur. When you rub one against each other, you get that the plastic will steal electrons from the fur. The fur will become charged positively and the electrons will jump on the plastic rod and the plastic rod will become negatively charged. <coughs> Sorry. So now if you take this plastic pencil and bring it close to pieces of paper, this piece of paper will be attracted toward it. It's an electrostatic attraction. It's not the magnetic one. It's because the pen is charged negatively and the piece of paper, remember in the piece of paper, the protons inside the nucleus cannot move, but the electrons can. And so the electrons are repelled away and the nucleus, positive nucleus, are getting closer to the edge of the paper that is closer to the pencil and that creates an electric field and an attraction that is sufficient to overcome uh, the gravitational force. Anybody can probably have tried that. It, it also causes your air, for example, when you uh, rub against uh, a carpet to stick out or when you have a cloth in a clotting in a, a dry climate, you have sparks sometimes happen. Just like this one, when you try to touch a doorknob after walking briskly on the carpet, <clears throat> you may be zapped like this, like a short lightning happening between your finger and the knob. By the way, walking on a carpet like that, you can charge up your body up to 30,000 volts. I know it's a lot of voltage, it's way more than 120 volts that we have on our circuits. But what saves you is you're not grounded and you have touching nothing. That's why you have this thing when this discharge between you and the knob when you are charged like that. And actually what happens here is that it's the door knob that gives you electron. That's what the charge is. And it, it is happening because an electric field is created between your tip, fingertip and the door knob. And it becomes so strong that the electrons have to move along the electric field and get to your body. This is the same process actually as lightning in a thunderstorm, but at a much smaller scale. I mean, imagine how much voltage need to be created in the clouds, between the clouds and the ground for an electric discharge of what 10,000 feet high uh, can happen and zap through the ground. And that's how actually the earth gets charged is that the clouds in the lightning give electrons to the surface of the earth. <clears throat> and that's why we feel when we're next to a, a lightning or a thunderstorm, and there's lightning happening, we feel like, oh, there's electricity in the air. Yes, there is. That is true. So magnetic field is totally different beast. Here's an example uh, of a sheet of paper with iron fillings on it. And when we place an, a magnet, a bar magnet underneath, what will happen is that the iron, which is a ferromagnetic material. So that means it can sense magnetic field. Most material cannot and will get because they're not ferromagnetic. And I'll explain a little bit later what is special about iron. So in any case, so you have here <clears throat> the iron fillings that actually follow the line of force of a magnet. And if you notice, we have a North Pole and a South Pole not a positive pole and a negative pole, because this is not electricity, it's magnetism. For example, if you were to put your pen right here uh, that is charged negatively, the pen will not be attracted towards the North Pole or the South Pole. It's not the way a magnetic field works. If the electric charge, if you move the pen, you will see that the pen will have a force pushing it around the magnets, not towards the pole. 
It's totally different thing. The magnetic field is totally different thing as the electric field. So in recap, let's look at the difference between electric fields and magnetic fields. So, <clears throat> sorry. Electric field arises when electric charge, from electric charge. So they're always present. As soon as you get an imbalance between the number of protons and the number of electrons in the material, you get electrostatic charge and you can sometimes, you know, feel it. The strength of the electric field is measured in volts per meter. You might see that in some books. Uh, the electric field uh, is present even when a device is switched off and there is no current. And most building materials shield electric fields to some extent. Very easy to shield electric field. On the other hand, magnetic field arises from currents, electric charge in motions. Now people say, well, well what about magnets? Well, if you look at, uh, microscopically at magnets, they actually have electrons that align the turn around their nucleus in a certain organization that the align, it, they, it's like small, an atom is also like a small magnet. But in certain elements like iron, they align themselves and they create from millions of small currents around atoms, they create a big magnetic field, which is a magnet. So even in magnets, magnetic field arise from currents. So their strength is measured in ampere per meters. You'll probably never see that. Most of the time you hear about a related and a quantity that is the magnetic flux density, which is in microtesla, millitesla, a gauss or mini gauss. For example, the magnetic field of the earth is 0.5 gauss or 500 milli gauss. It's quite a small magnetic field and yet it has physiological impact. If you are deprived of the geomagnetic field, you will feel it after a couple of hours. Uh, magnets have much stronger magnetic field. And we can talk about micro Tesla and milli Tesla because one Tesla is gigantic magnet. It's uh, 10,000 times a Gauss. So one Tesla would be 10,000 Gauss. Very, very strong magnet. Three, magnetic field exists as soon as the device is switched on and current flows. No magnetic field exists before that. Four, magnetic fields are not attenuated by most materials. They can go through, you know, copper, they can grow to walls, they can grow to almost anything except ferromagnetic materials, such as iron, nickel, and cobalt. And all these three actually are used to make magnets. The very strong magnets are made normally of an alloy of nickel and cobalt. Okay, that's very good. So uh, now that brings us to myth number three. EMF contains electric charges and can create a current that can zap you. You hear that a lot of people who are building hygienists and they don't want you to be grounded in a house because they claim that because of the presence of electromagnetic field that are coming out of the wires, ions are created. Again, the ions are coming up and that will flow through your body, which they can't obviously, and that create a current that will zap you and that's very dangerous. Nothing can be further from the, the, the truth. If somebody tells you that, just turn them off, look at somebody else for counsel on this or information in this field, because these people, they don't know what they're talking about. There's no electric charge in electromagnetic field first, and second, ions cannot flow into a body, even though the body has some liquid, and that means that it's possible if you get inside the body to make ions move, the outside of the body is solid. And a current, you know, can flow only if somebody has electric charge. But 
and electromagnetism doesn't have any. So that means now uh, we are ready, I think, to go to the next step and see how electromagnetic fields are generated. They're generated, they're, uh, they're, most of them are generated by antennas. And here you see an antenna, which is basically a wire that has a current that flows back and forth. You have electrons moving back and forth on this wire here, and that creates an electric field in blue and a magnetic field in red, and it goes in the back here and becomes yellow, but they are perpendicular to each other. So if the electric field is in this plane here, the plane of the paper, the magnetic field will be in the opposite plane, the plane that is 90 degrees uh, from the, the paper, from the, this piece of paper. And these, these two will flow and will zap through space at the speed of light, um, which is extremely fast. Let's look a little bit more closely to what happens. So here we have the electric field. So let's pretend that this is the antenna. And the, ele the electric field is generated along this vertical line. So as the electron move, uh, it generates magnetic field that propagates and it goes like this. It go up and down and up and down. And what is now the relationship? Why do we have a magnetic field also? It's because a varying electric field. When the electric field changes, um, the law of electromagnetism showed that a magnetic field is generated by a varying electric field. So the varying electric field induced in space at 90 degrees in the horizontal plane here, a magnetic field that will also be, be changing, but a magnetic field changing also produces an electric field. And so now the electric field will produce a magnetic field and you can see the interplay between the generation of the electric field and the magnetic field because they vary each other, they recreate each other. And this whole process travel at the speed of light, which is represented by the letter C here, which is very fast, 300,000 kilometers per second, 186,000 miles per second. How fast is that? Well, to give you an idea, a ray of light can do seven and a half, go seven and a half times around the planet Earth in only one second. That's how fast light is. And all electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic fields go at the same speed. For example, if you shine a light to the moon, the light takes about a second to get there. So that gives you an idea of the distance of the moon. And the sun, uh, the rays that we see from the sun, when we, we look at the sun, has come to us eight minutes before. The sun is eight minutes away in terms of light speed. That is 480 seconds. That means that the sun is 480 times farther away from us than the moon. So, but it means, but yet they look the same size. So if you look at uh, if you were to bring the sun as close to us as the moon, it will fill the entire sky. The diameter will be 480 times that of the moon. We will be burned out, of course. Just, just to give you an idea of what, how fast is the speed of light. Now, you hear often about electromagnetic field, about, oh, there is a wavelength of 10 microns or whatever or the frequency is five gigahertz. So let's get into understanding that. This comes from trying to characterize the electromagnetic wave. For example, uh, there's some thing called a cycle. A cycle is when an electrons move all the way down and go back up, you know, and start again the same cycle. So here, like for example, the electron 
the, the, this is the maximum of the electric field. It goes down and then comes back up. Now the distance that the electromagnetic wave has traveled during that time is called the wavelength. It's represented here by the, the letter lambda. Let's look a little more closely here at this. Let's say that you have, let's say, a wavelength and we follow it for one second. And we have here a wave, electromagnetic wave. So let's say that we're looking at the electric field. So it goes up and down uh, and goes back to zero. That's one cycle. We can start here, down and up. We can start anywhere as long as we have a full cycle. And then you start again, up and down. Uh, that's a second cycle. So that means that this electromagnetic wave has done two cycles in one second. So that's the frequency, a frequency of two cycle per second, which is also termed two hertz. That's where the term hertz is. The amplitude here is the strength of the electric field. The more powerful the antenna is at emitting, uh, you know, electromagnetic wave, the bigger the amplitude will be of the electric field and also the magnetic field that will be generated from it. But let's say now that I take this electromagnetic field and um, I have another one that zip, you know, that up and down twice as fast. So instead of having two cycle, we have four cycle in one second. So the frequency will be four cycle per second or four hertz. But you can even see that the wavelength will have to be shorter. And in fact, you can calculate that the wavelength will be half of what it is now. So that, interestingly, the product of the wavelength by the frequency is a constant. Here you have lambda, which represents um, the wavelength. And you have this letter Greek nu, which represents the frequency and you multiply the two by them and you get what? The speed of light. So that means that you can characterize any uh, wave by its frequency or by uh, its wavelength and you immediately know the other. So if you know the wavelength, you're in the microwave region, well you can immediately calculate from this equation what is the frequency band that we're talking about. So this is very simple, but yet a lot of physics in that. If you understand that, because everything is made of waves and vibrations. And so this is, these very basic concept will lead you very far in understanding, you know, about the nature of reality. So, uh, just for your information, sound, people think sound is in the same frequency of some electromagnetic field. It might be, but it's a totally different beast. Sound exists only when there are atoms and molecules in the environment. No sound in an empty space, while electromagnetic field can travel in empty space for billions of miles. Uh, sound needs uh, air or a medium with atoms. For example, here you have a speaker and you have a membrane that move back and forth. That creates zone of, comp zone of compression in the air, zone of rarefaction. So we have increased pressure, decreased pressure compared to the normal atmospheric pressure. And that travels at the speed of sound, which is much slower than the speed of light, but it's still pretty fast. About 1100 feet per second. So this comes to your ear, and what's gonna happen is that it's gonna make your, your ear uh, drum vibrate. And then that's what's gonna be detected by your nervous system. And um, air is a good medium for sound, but if you are 100 meters or like even 100 feet from someone, you need to yell pretty strong to be able to talk to a person. Well, Materials that are more density like water, the sound transmits much easier. A whale can talk to another whale about a mile distance away. 
And in solids like wood, it's even faster and even easier. And best is metals, sound transmit so well. But um, that was just an aside to let you know, don't confuse electromagnetic wave with sound wave. It's a completely different thing. Now let's look a little bit at the electromagnetic spectrum. So, I mean, the frequency, here you have on the left side the frequency, and you have the wavelength. Again, the product of the frequency by the wavelength will give you always the speed of light. So we, they, they are related. But for a seek of completeness, I took a scale that has both of them. And so you can have a great variety of frequencies. I mean, from zero, which is a static electric field with no magnetic field, to all the way through gamma rays with a frequency in, um, in the, uh, in the billions of billions of cycles per second. So let's start at the bottom, the long waves here. Uh, long waves are generated, for example, very low frequency, like the 60 hertz of your house will generate long waves or the 50 hertz, depending on where you are. Very, very long wave of uh, 50, 50, 50, uh, so let's see, you can have a wave at 60 hertz of about 5,000 kilometers. That's how long these waves are. So when a wave leaves your wire, there's so long before it needs about 5,000 kilometers above before you get one cycle. So then the cycle go up very quickly, one million, and then you get to the radio waves, which like AM, FM, and now you have in the 100 megahertz. So that's 100 million hertz. And so all the way to 1,000 megahertz, which is one gigahertz, which is one billion hertz. And it keeps going up. So after a radio TV, we have the microwave which will be the origin of interest because most of the Wi-Fi wireless stuff today, uh, 3G, 4G, 5G, we're gonna talk a little bit about that, are all in the microwave region. And then you have faster than that, I mean, with higher frequency, you have thermal infrared rays, which we feel as heat. The sun, we heat, and when the sun is heating our skin, the heat that has been transferred for 480 seconds from the sun to us is actually infrared light, which we don't see. And then you have this minuscule part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum that we call the visible. That's the only thing that we can see between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. Nano means 10 to the minus nine. So that shows our short visible light the wavelength of visible light. And the frequencies are so high, they are in the thousands of billions of Earths. So after that, we have the ultraviolet. Normally the ultraviolet also has three bands also, A, B, and C, which the A closes to visible. But the more they go in frequency, the more damaging they are. And then you have the X-rays that are used, for example, by dentists or doctors to see your bones and your teeth. Well, at that point, these are so energetic that now we're talking about rays and gamma rays are even more energetic. So notice that above the visible, it becomes rays and before the visible, it's waves. That is because this is a quantum physics effect that was not predicted by classical physics, is that when the wavelength gets short enough, the electromagnetic wave bunched up into particles that we call photons. And this effect start to be uh, noticeable in the visible spectrum, where both 
vis uh, the, the particle aspect or the frequency aspect can be seen depending on what type of experiment you design. There's a lot of information you can find on the internet in books about what is the nature of light. Is it a wavelength? Is it a wave or is it a particle? Well, the dualistic notion that the duality, that principle that Niels Bohr brought to physics was that it's both. We still have to clarify that, I think, in my opinion. But then after that, they become like little balls. Like when you have an X-ray taken of you, you have these little balls of electromagnetic energy that are shoot to you, and they have much energy. These above the visible are called ionizing radiation. They can create ions. They can knock off an electron out of the atom or the molecules. They can damage your DNA. So they are very, very strong. So try to get as little X-rays as possible in your life because they say that it's cumulative to some extent. If you're grounded, your body will have extra capacity to heal even from that. So with that said, let's go to look a little bit closely to the microwave so that we understand what are 5G, 4G, etc. So here you have the frequency band with the low side around 700 megahertz here and all the way up to 300. Uh, I don't even know how to say that. So many hertz here. That is, we have terahertz, petahertz, and exahertz, which are like 10 to the 18 hertz. So many frequencies too, too high. And you notice here you have the ionizing radiation band and the non-ionizing radiation. Now, some agency says, okay, uh, only ionizing radiations are dangerous. So we should be careful about these. Non-ionizing radiation are not dangerous, which is, of course, not true. And we'll go a, a bit over this in a moment. So, so 700 megahertz, you can have TV, but you can have also some uh some of these bands that are used for 5g so we have 2g 3g and 4g which are right here between 200 gigahertz maybe a 2 gigahertz sorry or even 1 gigahertz to about 2.5 2.6 3 gigahertz at the max and what is the difference between 2g 3g and 4g it's just that the technology got improved. A 2G cell phone was a bulky thing that looks like a walkie-talkie. And then they got better, but at the same time, the electronics become more sophisticated in being able to send more data for at the same frequency. And then you have 4G, which is more like around 2.6 gigahertz. So all of these are just improvement in the same energy band. I just want to show you here that it comprises the 2.45 gigahertz band, which is microwave that are used into your microwave oven. It just happened that the technology is well known for this band. So they made Wi-Fi also the same frequency and also uh, Bluetooth is at 2.45 gigahertz. Isn't that interesting? So in this region, you have a, an effect that is similar to a microwave where you can heat water with these electromagnetic wave. We are 70% water. So, I mean, it would be surprising to me that they do nothing. Of course, they don't have the same power than they are in microwave ovens. They're much, 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 much less. But still, you know, it's not reassuring that we use the same wavelength as those of a microwave that actually cook your food uh, with, because of the presence of water. So 5G is very different beast, much more complex than 2G, 3G, and 4G, because in 5G, they plan to use three different blend width. The extremely high, the 5G air wave, which actually are not possible anymore the FCC has already granted the 24 gigahertz band 
to AT&T for most of the country. And some other uh, network are planning to use 28 gigahertz. China is planning to use 20, 28 gigahertz and other bands. But, and these are the bands that will give you the fastest data transmission. They can give you data transmission as being recorded at a little bit above one gigabyte per second. Very, very fast. But there's a problem with these. The wavelength is so short that it does not penetrate. So now when the electric field is blocked, like they are easily blocked by anything, the wavelength is too short. The magnetic wave, magnetic part of the, of the electromagnetic wave is, does not have enough distance to move out, you know, to move out of the material and regenerate the wave, which is what happened. When you have longer wavelength, like uh, here, this 5G middle band between three and four gigahertz and this lower one, the wavelength is long enough so that when the wave, the, the electric field is stopped, the magnetic field goes through and because the magnetic field is long enough, goes through and regenerate the wave on the other side of the wall. When, when, um, when the wavelength is too short, it's not happening. I mean, even the leaf can stop those. So those bands are planned to be used outside in populated areas like a busy street in downtown or in places where you have lots of people but there's nothing in between like a big stadium, for example. Uh, so, but, and also outside, for example, for smart cars that will be able to use that because there will be many antennas out there that will guide the cars. But for when you are in your home, this is not what you have to fear. It's not going through, it's not happening to you. So they need another band that is able to transmit high data and at the same time going through your wall. And that's why you have these three to four uh, gigahertz band that is gonna be the mid band for 5G. Because although it doesn't have high data transmission capability as the high frequencies here have, they're still very high. They still can go 10 times the normal 4G right now. But in some places, they also plan to use lower bands like T-Mobile now advertise on the TV that they will have blanketed the whole of the United States with their system. But the system that they're planning to use to do that is at 600 megahertz. So it goes through everything. And although it's not gonna be much more actually, it's not gonna be faster than the 4G, it's in preparation for having then the next bandwidth, which is this one here. And maybe also the next bandwidth. AT&T is proceeding the same way. They have the 800 megahertz band. And they're starting with that. So you can see here that in reality in your home, uh, the only difference is that because they want to have higher frequency and higher data transmission in the mid band, which is a little higher than, you know, the 4G, they will bring the transmitter closer to your home so that more is coming through the walls so that your cell phone can have 10 times more data than it can have right now. So, and people worry about these antenna outside, but how about the antenna inside? Your cell phone is an antenna itself. So it receives information from the antennas outside. But then when you speak on the phone, 500 milliwatts of power is going out. This is the power of your cell phone. About half a watt of energy is transmitted outside. So the big transmitter is right here in your hands. It's your cell phone. So it would be prudent, you know, to keep it as far of yourself as you can. Because again, these work close to the microwave region.
So this is just prudence, you see? And uh, while I'm saying all this because people are asking information about this, you can see that 5G is no different than 4G in reality in terms of the damaging effect, except if you are outside in the very high band, which will be very powerful bands because they will be focused on you. The 5G at this frequency, about 20 gigahertz, is a very different beast. It's focused beam of energy. But in general, if you're a healthy person, you still don't have to worry about this. If you're grounding yourself every day, keep your cell phone out of your pocket, put it in your purse or carrying it, you know, away from your body. Even if you have it like a feet away, it makes a huge difference. Use a earplugs with a cable to connect to your phone, to talk to your people. Uh, there are ways also to get rid of the wireless, the Wi-Fi. You can use cables, which is what I do. And you put a cable is actually faster than Wi-Fi and it's safer. So you can do these things to mitigate the effect of of these uh, electromagnetic field. And I always work grounded on my computer. And, um, but if you're a healthy person, you don't have, and you ground yourself every day, you will not have any problem with, you know, the precautions, sim simple precautions that I've been talking about. There are some people who are electromagnetic sensitive. So they will feel these feel just being inside a home, they feel the buzzing sensation. And so they say you cannot ground because you're feeling this buzzing because you are the element. You can ground. You will still get benefits. It's just unpleasant. So for you. But you still need grounded. In fact, if you are electro hypersensitive, or if you have any other, you know, most of the disease are due to inflammation in your body, cardiovascular disease most cancers, Alzheimer's, uh, you name it, uh, autoimmune problems such as diabetes, arthritis, all of these things are immune-based. immune, immune based. If you get grounded, you get your immune system working to the max. You get your body to be relaxed and so be able to regenerate itself. You charge up your battery into your mitochondria which are really the batteries of your cells. There can be a thousand or more by cell of these ba little batteries. And you're making all the chance of your side, you know, of staying uh, healthy uh, if you do that. Of course, you need good nutrition. It's not a panacea where you do only your thing and I can go and do anything. I can drink, uh, you know, three bottles of wine every night. I can party no, non-stop, uh, eat any junk food I like, and everything will save me. No, it's not like that. I can tell you that, that you still need to have good nutrition. You still have to have a good lifestyle. But everything will go a long way in helping you. And other things that, you know, even it's very difficult, for example, uh, in the world we live today, you know, many people, we have an epidemic of diabetes. And these people are not bad people. Many of these people don't eat differently than normal people do. You go to McDonald's and stuff like that. But still, it's not uh, congruent with a good lifestyle for us. Because all processed food are charged positively. So we are fed all the time with positive charge, positive charge. When you grow a vegetable in your home or in your home in your garden it's been in contact with the earth it's charged with negative energy the electrons not the ions maybe there's some ions but the electrons have been charging of the earth has been charging that and when you eat that you have a live food and in fact you can buy a little device called an oxidation reduction potential device which is just like a pen stick it in a in a fruit and if it goes negative, it's a good fruit. If it goes positive, it will deplete you of energy. So we need to ground ourselves the best way that nature intended for us to be healthy. We need to do it every day. It's like a vitamin. If we miss it, we're gonna suffer. It's, you cannot 
ground yourself 24 hour a day for a month and say, I'm done for the rest of my life. It doesn't work that way. Have to ground every day, at least half an hour if you're healthy. If you're not healthy, you'll need more time. So, uh, so I'm hoping that this cleared up a lot of misunderstanding about electromagnetic radiation. Understand it's not a huge threat if you know how to live healthy and be grounded. And uh, I think that's the end of my presentation. Perfect. Thank you so much, Gaetan, for preparing that whole presentation for us. It was very informative and covered a lot of the questions we've received about how the human body is affected by electromagnetic frequencies when grounded. Um, so I think now we're going to go ahead and jump into asking you and Clint some of the pre-submitted questions that we've received. And then hopefully that will clear up everybody's questions. Um, so question number one, does grounding induce current in the body from EMF sources? The answer is obviously no. It's the opposite. It prevents any creation of current. In fact, there's a paper done by two researchers in Poland that stick electrode inside the body. And so they try to generate currents when the person is ungrounded inside the body, no problem. They were able to. But when the person is grounded, no current were generated inside. It was flat out. If people are interested, we, this study is on our Earthing Institute website. No, okay. that doesn't happen. Okay, next question. How does grounding help with EMF sensitivity, adrenal fatigue, and seasonal allergies? And some of these questions may be a bit redundant, but we just wanna to try to get through as many as possible. Yeah, so I kind of addressed that during my presentation is that Earthing is always important if you want to heal from any problems. You need to be grounded as much as possible. It will help any condition you can imagine on the planet. There's nothing that will not be helped if you're grounded. So people ask sometimes, well, the only caveat is this, is that if you take medication, that is like medication for thyroid, for example. So earthing is a blood thinner. It will thin your blood naturally. The body does not see the extra medication coming in as own, uh, its own thing, you know? It, it, it is an outside source that interfere with the proper function. So when you ground your cell, the body will try to reestablish the proper function of the thyroid gland, and that will interfere. And it's the same thing with people taking insulin, so you just check with their doctor if you're taking medication. But other than that, you know, grounding is a must do for everybody. Okay. Uh, our next question is, if the earthing mat is plugged into a receptacle with dirty electricity, will it be ineffective? No. In fact, it's very active, effective to block dirty electricity. First, when you are grounded, you are not closing a circuit. There's no current that can go through you because it's the end point, you know? You have, you're plugged into a circuit and, and, and there's no current that can flow because well, you need a closed loop to have a current. So all you have is you can have these electric fields, okay? They can be there, which are generated by dirty electricity. And what is dirty electricity? People think of two components, ground, ground current, which are basically in existence, so you can forget that, and, uh, and high spike, frequency spikes that happen in the voltage of the power source, which happen because, for example, you take a fridge that turned back on and off, Every time there's a spike degenerated in that, that's true. It goes through around into your power. If you have dimmer switch, for example, they're very good at generating this noise, high frequency noise. Um, and some uh, like a, a air dryer with um, a motor that can generate all of these things. But they don't penetrate your body when you are grounded. So they, they're there. They're, there's no current to it. So they can affect you in the first place. And we've shown again by the work of the doctors in, in Poland that they don't even penetrate your body when you're grounded. So really, 
the thing about dirty electricity is when somebody talks to you about dirty electricity being dangerous, just walk away. These people are trying to scare you. Check to see if they're not having some kind of reasons to sell you something, you know, some filters, or they want to go to your home and fix the electro electricity there or something. But just walk away. You don't need to hear about dirty electricity. Just forget it. It's not needed. Okay. Thank you, Gaetan. Um, this is our last question about dirty electricity. Is there dirty electricity in the ground where electric lines are buried? If so, can it come through my earthing product if it's connected to a ground rod or okay. plugged into an outlet? Yeah. So sometimes you will have high power lines buried underground. This is not happening on your property, on the streets and stuff like that. So you don't have to worry. You're not going to put a, a ground rod there. And then in some places, you have the 120 hertz or the 240 hertz coming to your house. Instead of being coming out, they come underground, okay? So there's no dirty electricity generated there. It's low frequency 60 hertz coming in. And because they are buried into the ground and the earth is conducting, the electromagnetic field generated around that doesn't go far. So it just be aware that these are there. They can be a foot or two feet down and you should not put a rod close by. You can poke them by mistake. Just stay away about 10, 15 feet from them and you can use a grounding rod anywhere else. You just need to know if you have that in your yard, you know, uh, which is happens, you know, but it's a low power. It's not, it, it's, it's, it goes away. You just need to know where it is don't put your rod there and it doesn't change anything about the electricity in your house, the grounding, you know, a house where people are afraid of using the third prong of a house. Well, in reality, this grounding system, you know, that we have in the house is connected to, to uh, grounding rods that are all around that were built with the building in the basin, you know, the foundation of the building they are at least eight feet deep. It's very, very good ground. The only problem is you need to make sure that your house is wired properly and you won't have any problem using them. I've been using, I've been grounding myself using power outlets since uh, probably 2007, at least 10 years, no, 13 years, no problem. Okay. And we even use them, sorry, we even no, no. use them. We've used them in many of our studies with great results. The study, for example, of improvement of blood, uh, blood flow in the face, it was done in a place using the power outlet. So they're good. Just need to make sure that you're feeling comfortable, that you have good, you know, grounding, properly grounded and properly wired electrical system in your house. That's it. Okay, perfect. Um, the next question, does errant electricity deliver a harmful kilohertz radio frequency that attaches to a line voltage riding along an internal wiring circuits, including ground and neutral wiring? Okay, that makes me laugh because we just saw that kilohertz and what was the other term that says kilohertz and megahertz in the question? Um, radio frequency? Radio frequency are not in the kilohertz range. So this person already, uh, uh, well, they don't know exactly what they're talking about. Uh, but can you repeat the question? This start, struck me and I yeah. forgot what the rest of the question. <laughs> uh, does errant electricity deliver a harmful kilohertz radio frequency that attaches to line voltage riding along the internal wiring circuits, including ground and neutral wiring? Yeah, that's an interesting concept that is non-existent. But again, it's about ground current or whatever creeping into your neutral and or to your uh, ground wire. And the ground wire being in proximity of the other wire, there's some exchange of energy and all that. I mean, no, no, you just, just forget that. Okay. It's... Uh, Again, you know, they come up with very original ideas and people scratch their head because they don't know what to make out of these things, you know. 
In reality, it's very simple. If you don't understand what the person is talking about, if they can't explain to you something basic, how it works, it's useless. Don't listen to these people because they will come up with the most fantastic Star Trek uh, techno babble that you can ever see on the planet. Okay. Um, our next question is, my home is located within about 400 um, feet of high voltage power lines. How do I protect, protect against their effects? Now, again, these are, uh, these are power lines at 60 hertz. That's low frequency. You just ground yourself and you're protected. There's a video recently done by a Dr. Andrew Doan who put himself right under, I think it's a 450 kilohertz power line, right under. The, when he was not grounded, the voltage generated on his body was like 17 to 20 volts. That's very high. And he put his feet on the ground and it went down to what? 50 millivolts, almost nothing. So you're protected. And I'm sure Clint has something to say about cows uh, grazing, you know, under power lines. No problem. No. no problem. So all he has to do is to be grounded, you know, and it will be fine. Uh, next question is, can you please provide more detail regarding the dangers of smart meters? I recently moved to Tennessee and the house I'm renting has a smart electric meter. How do I protect myself from the EMFs resulting from the smart electric meter? Okay, smart meters, they are powerful emitters just like the cell phone is. And if you have, I remember a lady who came to me and she was worried about that because they put a smart meter right behind where she sleep, her head is. And so she was starting to have headaches. Now what happened with these smart meters, they are very high frequency. So a lot of the time they are very quiet, but suddenly when they start sending information to the, 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 the source out there, they have very high transient power, very high power but they have very high frequency. So they can be blocked by a simple aluminum foil. I know aluminum is not very healthy, but a simple, so I, I said, just put, you know, in the region where it is, just put some kind of metallic shielding there and you'll be, you'll be okay. And she was very creative. She <clears throat> found out a, a frame with a, 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 a carved picture and made of copper. So it was very nice. She put that there. It was very large, about three feet by three feet. She put that there, and that solved her problem. So smart meters are very easy to take care of. You know, it's just blocked. Because they are so high frequency, you just block them very easy. OK. Um, the next question is, can you please speak to the hum, the Schumann resonance? Ah, the Schumann resonance. This is, this is, this is a good question. Uh, the Schumann resonance, remember, I explained that the uh, array of light can go around the planet uh, seven and a half times in one second. Interestingly enough, the, this is about the frequency of the Schumann resonance. It's 7.8 Hertz. And why is that? It's because Schumann resonance is created by lightning on this planet. Lightning generates lights, but other electromagnetic fields that are able to travel all around the planet. And they travel at the speed of light, which is seven and a half times, you know, the diameter of the planet, about the 7.8. So that's why you have this Schumann resonance. And it happens that all living beings on this planet have been submitted to lightning like this for millions, and hundreds of millions of years. So what that means, our nervous system and our brain has developed and trained by this frequency. It's just in the alpha range, close to the theta, which is very calming, very soothing. Uh, now, in our homes, we submit it to 60 hertz. When you're not grounded, it goes into your brain and you get submitted to that. But when you are grounded at home, you get the Schumann resonance through your grounding product. You also get that to your grounding product. Because 
the Schumann resonance does not be done some tests, it does not go through the houses um, unless some other frequencies. It's it's uh, it's blocked. So to have the Schumann resonance, you go outside. Or you ground yourself and you get not only the frequencies of the Schumann resonance, but other frequencies that will tell you where you are on the planet. If you go, for example, Europe and you have the jet lag, well, to not have the jet lag, you just put your feet for 30 minutes in the ground there and you will not have jet lags. The body internal clocks will reset to the local time. And we have many testimonies on that. So yes, it's a great question. And so there's more benefits than we even imagine, you know, from being in contact with the earth. Okay, great. The next question is, does having connection cables with a filter to stop harmful frequencies or dirty electricity make sense? For example, the Laura Caniver cable. Mm -mm. We don't need that. I told you, dirty electricity doesn't cause any damage. And, uh, and our experience is cable with filters like this. They don't work very well because a filter needs to have a capacitor. And a capacitor is two parallel plates. They don't touch each other. So that means the current coming one direction, the electrons coming in one direction are blocked. They cannot go in the other direction. So we found that Yes, there's a little lowering of the voltage if you connect yourself to this cable, which is like, let's say that you have one volt on voltage, it goes down to half a volt, but grounding will get you to zero volts. So, and the reason why you get some is because the field effect is still there. But these cables are basically expensive and inferior in terms of what they produce. A cable with 100 kilohomes, um, kilohom uh, resistor to limit the current is the best and that's what Lintover's products do. So we've used them by the way in our research project. Many of them work great results in our research. So this, these products have been actually tested in research projects. Okay, great. My understanding is that there are negative effects of using a heating blanket because of the constant electricity against our bodies. What is the difference between using a heating blanket and an earthing mat? Well, it's quite different. <laughs> uh, the heating mat doesn't work on electricity. It's just grounded. It's just connected use, like putting your feet on the ground. Well, a heating mat, you have these, um, this electricity coming through and you have these resistive elements that heat up because of the electricity. So you get the electromagnetic field at 60 Hertz that goes right into your body very close by. And, um, and you, you did this heat, okay, you get the heat. My recommendation is this, I mean, you can do it grounded, but still that, you know, why not just warm up the, the warming pad first, bring it very warm, Unplug it and use the warm pad without it, you know, and you can yeah. use a warm pipe without the electricity. Yeah. That would be my recommendation. I just want to add something that comes to mind. Not all frequencies are bad. Like you said, the Schumann resonance is good frequencies. In general, very low frequency below the 30 hertz region are frequencies that the body is used to. And you can have some devices that will give you these low frequencies and they have had good results. So that I, I wanted to put that here because I'm starting to give the impression that electromagnetic field is bad and you have to go on another planet or something. <laughs> that's not the case. You have good ones too. Okay, perfect. Um, this next question reads, I sleep on a full body size beamer set up or set on sleep mode when I sleep, which has electromagnetic frequencies to improve microcirculation, help with detox and health. We just got the earthing mats and first tried them near our heads. Too much awareness to sleep well. Did better with them near our feet, but will this negate my beamer? How can I do both? You can do both because this is exactly one example of very low frequency magnetic field going through your body. They're not stopped, they go to your body. And um, what they do is that the ions, we have ions into our bodies, into the liquid parts, and it makes them move. You can have like some liquid in the muscle, you can have a sore muscle, 
and they will make the electrons move or the ions move. What they cannot do that earthing can do is give you more electrons. If you are, for example, having pain on the elbow, elbow, tennis elbow or something, and you have some inflammation there. With PMF, you'll be able to get rid of the pain, but what will happen is the positive charge that were there will move somewhere else. You might have arthritis in the next month or two, or you may have some other problems. So yes, it's helpful, but it's much better to use it when you are grounded. And I've done it for a year, I had the opportunity to do that, it's wonderful. So there's no contraindication there. Awesome, thank you. Um, our next question is, when you want to grow bone back, for example, if someone were to have severe osteoporosis in the spine and hips, how are your products helpful and what would be the time frame to see results? Time frame is hard to tell because it depends on everybody's health and physiology and stuff like that. But here is what happens uh, with osteoporosis. People are not grounded for a long time. The body is deficient in electrons. But it needs sometimes, you know, to function. It needs to ward off some, some inflammation somewhere. And, uh, and especially if it's a vital organ, inflammation of the liver or something like that. So what the body does, it says, okay, you know, I need electrons desperately. So we're gonna take them from the bones. The bones are the least damaging one. So it's gonna take some and take some and it will go, but after some years of this, you have what? Osteoporosis. So osteoporosis can be reversed by grounding. How much time it takes, I don't know. It depends on too many variables. What other conditions a person has. Um, if they're missing electrons many places, inflammation all over the body, it may take a long time because that's not the urgency for the body. The urgency is keeping the vital organs function, which are the liver, you know, heart, pancreas, all of these organs are, they, the body will rather lose a limb than you know, lose the liver, okay? <laughs> the body's trying to manage itself, you know? Right. So osteoporosis, if you have that, you are electron deficient, no problem, no doubt. Okay. Do you think that the healing effect of earthing of the body will depend on the value of the electric field strength of the earth at the, at the earthing point and on the time of earthing? Yes, to some extent. Like, for example, in Russia, the, uh, if you go way north, the uh, um, electric field of the earth is much smaller in the, in, 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 and so on and so forth. But the effect is minimal. You will, let's say that apparently in Cuba, the electric field is very high. So that means you can get a lot of energy quickly. And you go in Moscow or upper north there, and it's only 60 volt per meter, while the other is 500. But in terms of getting electrons from the herd, you will see a factor of two. It's negligible. If it takes two milliseconds instead of one milliseconds, doesn't matter doesn't really matter. So as a ground everywhere you can, make sure there's no pesticide where you are. <laughs> so that's about it. You know? Oh yeah, there's no worm. That's, there's some places there are worms that right <laughs> get into your feet. That's a bit gross, but you know, besides that, don't worry about <laughs> stuff. Right. Perfect. Okay, the next question is, is it better to not ground in some home situations? Uh, well, I don't see why you wouldn't ground. If you have a wiring system that is defaulted and you have 120 volt volts on your ground wire, obviously you don't want to use it. <laughs> but you can still ground by using a rod outside, okay? But some people live in the 10th floor of an apartment complex where they don't have that and maybe the building is miswired, so maybe someplace you need to move. Okay. I mean, it's, you just need to use your judgment, you know? So, oh, okay, can, can, will I be able to earth myself? How is the, 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 you see the house dates back to 1942 
and you have, you know, outlet there with three holes, but the third holes are not connected to anything, but you don't notice. You try to ground yourself there and use that. And you see, oh, I feel tingling and all that stuff. And of course, you know, get your house checked to see, make sure you have a good grounding system. You may not have one at all. Right. That's what happened to me in my last house. It was the house <laughs> built in 1907. So there I had to go. update it. <laughs> and they update it, but just for the appearance. You know, you get the three prong there and stuff. Right. But it's not connected to anything. Okay, um, our next question is, is there any research that might show an actual draw from the earth as it is pulling EMFs from the body as it delivers free ions that go past zero? Here you go again, the free ions moving along a wire. An impossibility, uh, as I explained. Uh, you could have electrons and we are working uh, on a project presently with uh, with a health practitioner that tried, because we know that region of inflammation are region of high pocket of positive charges. And sometimes you have to break them down. For example, a massage therapist would bring them down. And so we have wired somebody like that with a, to the ground. And we have this person working on some patients. And we see when this person is working on the patient and the patient has some problems, we see surge of current, not ions, the electrons, going in the body, try to neutralize that. So we're working towards understanding what is the relationship between the electrons there, how they get into our bodies. And, um, and uh, we have uh, preliminary results, but we don't have not, have not analyzed that. And interestingly, if you take a person who is not an expert in the field, and this type is a craniosacral therapist, and you take somebody and just hold the head of the person, we see no effect. So it's really what the therapist does that creates something interesting, unblock some energies, and the patients feel it too. So it's quite an interesting project. All right, and then our last question for today is, I have a sleep smart bed that utilizes Bluetooth to measure heartbeat and breaths. Will earthing products mitigate any possible negative effects from this type of bed? Well, if you're grounded, it will help you, as I said, but would be better uh, limit the exposure as much as possible. You know, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are exact at 245 gigahertz, the exact frequency of microwave radiation. I don't know. I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that, you know, but hurting will help. It's always help. It's not going to work less because you have this thing on your bed, but you have to understand, you know, if you are a very healthy person, you might not feel anything. You might be okay if you're ground yourself, but if you don't, uh, then that may be a problem. So, okay. So I personally will not, do it. I will be grounded, period. That's enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, that pretty much concludes our webinar from today. Clint, was there anything that you wanted to add? No, oh, I'm just very happy that uh, Gaetan had the give us the opportunity to uh, present his wisdom and expertise. And uh, Gaetan has been involved from for the last 15 years with most all of the research pro uh, projects and all the researchers. And so he has more uh, awareness and knowledge uh, than I can sometimes, you know, I, I'm the cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm really glad that Gaetan's here with, with us today. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I hope this was helpful. Yeah, I think you answered a lot of questions really well today, Gaetan, and we really appreciate having you. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us and for pre-submitting your questions. And as always, if you have any burning questions or any urgent questions that we have not yet addressed, please do feel free to send that over to our customer service team at help at earthing.com. They'll be happy to help or we'll um, add it to our list for our next webinar. And as a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be sent um, as an email link to everyone that's subscribed and it will also become available on our YouTube channel. Um, in, in a couple of weeks or so. 
Thank you again so much for joining us, Gaetan and Clint, and um, everyone that listened today, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.